when I really look at the vast majority of male doms who have any sort of, who take up any sort of space at a lot of these events, a lot of them aren't great people. Hey guys, it's Kat and it's time for another episode of True Tea. I want to thank you guys so much for joining me for yet another episode right here on this channel. We upload these videos every Tuesday at 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, and I appreciate those of you guys who have made True Tea part of your routine. Speaking of which, I want to clarify um, about comments. My comment system is really intense. I've got a lot of words in there, blocked phrases and things, that a lot of you guys who are leaving positive, fun, interesting, cool comments, you guys don't get approved because you use some of that language. I mentioned in a previous video that I'm going through and trying to make sure that everybody who is a regular commenter gets through. And what I, what I meant when I said that is that there is an option when I'm going through and approving comments where if you are a commenter that I know and trust, I can select always approve comments so that your comments always get through and do not have to be, you know, moderated, right? And to be clear, I don't mind people who disagree with me. I don't mind dissent as long as, as, long as it's respectful. I'm just trying to avoid trolls. Anyway, we are gonna be having a very interesting conversation in this video. And so as per usual, I would highly suggest you round your kitchen and grab yourself something to drink. Now, personally, I am drinking some um, green citrus tea by Tivana. I'm drinking it out of my Starbucks cup. Shout out to Angelique, um, student at CSUN who got this for me, really appreciate it. It makes me feel so ethical because it's like plastic and reusable, so thank you. Anyway, let's take a big sip of this and get right into this video. So I'll be honest, I'm a little nervous about having this conversation because this is a part of my life that I have definitely referenced, that I have definitely um, made known, but I've not really spoken in depth about. So I'm a bit nervous, but here we go. We are going to be talking about my problems with the BDSM community. <laughs> So jumping right in, I wanted to say that I, if you are not familiar with the BDSM community um, or BDSM in general, um, some of you guys know that I do have a podcast and I did this really great interview with a BDSM dom about um, BDSM. So I will put a link up to here if you guys are curious about that. It's the sort of interview that if you've never experienced BDSM, if you know nothing about it, you can watch that interview and get everything you, uh, you've ever needed from it. So watch that video, listen to that podcast, and you know, get a sense of what we're talking about here. I know for a lot of people, BDSM is just like something people do in their bedroom, you know? It's not a big deal to them, it's just something that they do to spice up their relationship. BDSM for me is a part of my lifestyle. It is a part of my social network. BDSM is like a hobby for me, you know, where some people, they have the bowling class. Um, I like to do BDSM classes and I like to go to BDSM events. It's a part of my life. It's a part of my social circle. It is again, part of my lifestyle. So it's not just this sort of thing I do in the bedroom. And I will be clear and say that BDSM for me is not inherently sexual. Now, part of the issue with me is that despite, you know, my confidence, my stature, and you know, my love of leather, I am a submissive woman. And that's just sort of how I am. I actually have a lot of discomfort with being um, a dom. Um, and if you're ever, if you guys wanna hear a story about why that is, cause I kind of have a very distinct reason why I don't wanna be a dom and it kind of is related to a funny story that I can tell you guys. Let me know if you guys wanna hear it, but I'm very much a submissive. And as we've already been through in these videos, I'm a submissive and I'm a heterosexual woman. I hopefully you guys can see where this is going. I deal with a lot of usually, but not always heterosexual cis men who are doms. And with that, unfortunately comes a lot of bullshit. And I'll be real with you guys, um, getting into the BDSM community as a feminist, um, I've definitely had a lot of internal conversations with myself about what does this mean? What are we really doing here? You know, I, I have a lot of um, things that I'm still sussing out. And some of the stories I'm gonna tell you guys, um, I think for those of you guys who are curious, are definitely going to be um, 
<laughs> off-putting because I've had some experiences. And to be honest, I, I think a lot of them do have to do with the fuzziness that I have around, um, around, you know, the dynamic of me being a feminist and also being a submissive. So I'm going to start out by saying that I don't have solid answers. I don't have some deep insight or critique of that portion of this conversation, but I did want to share with you guys some of my experiences. So here we go. So we have a bunch of different types of events at, um, in the BDSM community, right? We've got your munches, right? And munches are basically these events where it's usually hosted at a restaurant or a bar. And it's usually just people who can come to a place to meet people, to talk about the thing. It's just kind of like, let's all be in the same space, knowing that we're all into the same thing and have some conversations, right? And a lot of times when you go to munches, you will find out about these different types of events. From a munch, you could probably find out about these sort of clubby events, right? You guys know that I'm part of the goth community and there is an incredible intersection with goth and BDSM. When I first moved to Los Angeles, there were several sort of like goth events that had BDSM sections. And so, and it's usually at a club. And so because it's at a club, you can only usually do so much. You're not going to really get a full scene out of it. You're not going to get a whole thing. It's usually just kind of a bunch of people peacocking in sexy outfits, right? That's kind of what it is. And that's a whole nother conversation about Hollywood goth and Hollywood BDSM and the whole sort of it's another conversation for another day. Um, but those sort of events, right? You have those events, right? And then you have your actual dungeon events where these are events at a public dungeon where you can usually find people who are more lifestyle BDSM, people who are not just trying to look cute at the club, people who have usually gone through pretty intense systems of qualifications and experience and things like that. And that's where you'll get like an actual scene. And, um, and that's kind of what a lot of people who are really in the BDSM community, when I say really in the BDSM community, I don't mean like, you know, real BDSM, fake BDSM, but I mean like there's some people who have di different layers of devotion to this, you know? And usually people who go to the clubs are not always those people, right? So getting into the BDSM community, it's kind of very standard for, for people to have this feeling that doing play at a club event or a dungeon is just best practices. When you're, when you're first starting out, it's a really good idea to do stuff really publicly. And the idea behind that is usually at like a dungeon, you have what are called dungeon monitors, where you have these people who are walking around the dungeon, making sure that everything's okay. They're the kind of people who will advocate for you if you're in a compromising position with a top. And it's just kind of a safe, sort of thing. And so there is sort of this rule of public spaces are a little bit more comfortable and safe. Now, I don't feel that way anymore. We'll get to that later. But getting into the BDSM community, a lot of my going to dungeons and going to munches was just me sort of sitting there objectively and, and observing. I remember when I first started going to a BDSM um, dungeon and I would walk around and I would see people getting spanked and I would just be like so, I don't even know how to describe it. It was like such an, a weird thing to me. Like, it's like, I wouldn't be into that. Like, oh my God, like, why would I be? I, I didn't even know what I would be into. When I first started getting into it, I didn't know what I would like. And I, I definitely felt like it wouldn't be me being spanked, but here we are. <laughs> Shout out to Edge Play Gear. So getting into the community in LA, I kind of felt like I needed to have somebody to guide me in some, you know, in some way. And so here I am fresh me in the BDSM community. I walk into, um, I walk into a munch and back then when I first started getting out there, some of you guys who've been following me for a bit know that I had a very sort of conservative style. And when I started getting out to these events, it was like my first, like, Oh, I'm really going to do it up. I'm going to be sexy. I'm going to be cute. I'm going to, you know, celebrate and show my body and stuff. And it's like, I love attention. I got a lot of attention. Um, and I met this guy and he, um, was just really, really cool. We got along really, really well. Our personalities gelled. We have very similar sort of personalities. We're very kind of like loud people. And he is the sort of guy who 
He does do the dungeon events, but he also does a lot of the sort of tasting things at these big sort of club events. And I was trying to figure out the community and I was trying to, you know, get out there and figure out what we're doing. And so we started talking and spending time with each other um, at events usually. And he started inviting me to these events and started inviting me to these things. Um, and I really appreciated it because I didn't really have anybody out there who was advocating for me. Now, I will say that as a trans woman, there is a little bit of like a weird complication that I sort of experienced in the BDSM community. This was not only a guy who was, who had played with trans people before, but also was very experienced doing scenes with black women. Now, this is a whole other conversation to be had, but the BDSM community is very, very, very white, very white. And it's not that there aren't black people in the community. We will, we will get to, oh girl, I'm gonna tell so many stories in this video. <laughs> we will get to this later. There are black men in, in, in the black men in the community, but it's very white. It's very, very, very white. And, and part of Part of the issue in quotations with that is if you're somebody looking to get a nice bruise or something, most people are used to dealing with white women who are fairly easy to bruise. Doing that with a black woman is a whole other experience and it kind of is honestly something that you have to learn. It's not something that you, you usually can figure out because white women are a little bit easier to do that with. So, but here he was, he's this perfect, guy who, you know, is totally, you know, knowledgeable about all the things, right? We're gonna call him, what's a name that doesn't sound like his name? Um, David, let's call him David, right? He invites me to this yearly gathering, right? Um, and this was a gathering that like I had never been to. It was a BDSM gathering. Um, people come, come to it from all around the country. And I was honestly pretty nervous, but excited. I'd never been around so many people in the BDSM community. And up to this point, I'd only really done BDSM stuff with him and with my partner. And me and my partner at the time, we were definitely working up to doing a lot of stuff. And the things I was doing with David were kind of light, right? And so anyway, I go to this event and it's great. I see a bunch of different um, teachers teaching classes and things. I learn about different types of play. I bought this actually at, you know, the first one I went to and it was just such a great experience. And I met so many people in the community and it was just kind of a really awesome affirming thing. Um, I'm trying to tell these stories without being too specific about people and spaces and things, but this is, I think, an event that people will know about. So if you put two and two together, it kind of is what it is. Um, but I had a really great experience and the people that I met from that, you know, space were definitely people that I was going to be interacting with, you know, in the future in other spaces. I don't have a dom, so I'm free to sort of interact and talk to other people, right? Um, and so I got a lot of contact from this event. And so I started to know people and after real building up my confidence of going to munches and then going to dungeon events, I started being more open to doing scenes with people. Now, <laughs> this is where I think it gets kind of sad because it's a realization that I had have had recently. I have never bottomed for somebody who doesn't have some sort of accusation against them. I've bottomed for a handful of doms in Los Angeles, and I have not bottomed for somebody who does not have some sort of accusation against them. Now, when, when it comes to accusations, I don't wanna be somebody who doubts people, right? I don't wanna be somebody who says, okay, this person has this accusation, it's not true. I don't wanna deny what people say, right? But with the BDSM community, it is kind of a complicated thing where it's almost impossible to be a dom and not have someone at some point claim that you've done something to them that they didn't agree with. Um, it, it kind of in so many ways comes with the territory. Now, this is not to say that there aren't people who have perfect records out there, but I've met people who I definitely considered to be great players who other people 
told me and you know after i've done a scene with them or after i've become close to them that they've done this this and this and this and this there are definitely some people who because of drama have big issues that they're making about a person and they want to ruin his, their reputation that is a thing right that is a definite thing that does happen right but there are also people who um you know, are repeat offenders. And my sort of way of sorting through a lot of this stuff is if it's a story that I keep hearing over and over and over and over and over again, I'm going to just dismiss this person. So let's talk about one of the black men. <laughs> I mentioned in one of my videos that when I go to events, sometimes it's hard for me to remember everyone except for the black woman. And the reason why I said that was because there are so few black people at these events that when we see each other at these events, we're like, you know, and we try to connect with each other. We try to really have, because there's so few of us that it does feel very alienating. And so I kind of had this thing when I came to Los Angeles where I really, 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 really wanted to meet a black man who was in BDSM. So there was this guy that I knew in Los Angeles and I met him at the first annual meeting that I went to. And he is the sort of guy who has, <laughs> he is a master who has slaves. Now, the issue that I've had with black men in BDSM is that I have yet to meet I have yet to meet a dominant black man in the community who does not subscribe to the master slave thing. Now, for those of you guys who don't understand what, I'm, what I mean when I say that, usually the way that a master slave dynamic works is that he is the, um, usually it's a man who has a lot of submissives, all female, who play with him, but no one else. And they usually all live together and they usually share domestic, domestic duties and they are in a 24 seven dynamic where he is their master and they are his slaves. Now, when I met this guy, he honestly was very, 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 very charming. He seemed like just a genuinely nice, good person, right? And, you know, he would always ask me over for, um, <laughs> he'd always ask me over for dinner. Him and his slaves love to, you know, make these elaborate meals and invite people over. And honestly, when he, you know, told me about it, it sounded initially like a really good idea. Now, of course, when you're in the BDSM community, you like to get references. And much like I just told you, when I was talking to other people about the possibility of meeting this guy and going over to his place and having food with him and his slaves, um, I got a lot of you should watch out for that guy. Now, but I'm hard headed, okay? I am hard headed. And like I said, I don't like to just sort of take gossip as fact. I don't, right? And so um, I sort of put in the back of my head that I was going to, at, at some point in time, go and spend time with this guy at his house with his slaves. If anything, because I'm morbidly curious. And one thing you guys will find out about me as I tell stories of my life is that I unfortunately am drawn to very dark energy. And that causes me to maybe have experiences that I probably shouldn't have because I'm just so, I guess, curious about the way that things can go. Um, but anyway, so, <laughs> so I, um, I keep it in, in my mind of things to do. I want to connect with more black people in the BDSM community. And he at the time will still does have two black female slaves. And I think his other slaves are white women, right? Um, and so, you know, I was like, cool, we'll, we'll have dinner one day. And so he would kind of be very aggressive, right? He would always send me messages. He'd be like, hey, we're having dinner. Do you want to come over? And he always would ask me on like the day that I'm going on a date with somebody or like the day that I've made time to spend with my partner. It was like every time he asked me, every single time he asked me was just not a great time. And so I kept telling him, you know, I would love to, but I have plans today. And, you know, I told him this a bunch of times, but at a certain point he started getting really snippy with me. You know, I would tell him that 
you know, I was busy and that I would love to, but I can't. And he would be like, oh, well, you just don't want to do it, do you? You know, he would, he would get really pushy with me. And sometimes we do this thing that some black guys do where they think that I'm avoiding them because he's black and not because I'm busy. You know, it's this whole thing of like, oh, so you're gonna hang out with some white guy, right? And for the record, this guy who I'm talking about, this master does not like David, does not like David. David is unfortunately the sort of person who, David's the sort of person who on Facebook you have to block because he makes so many like intense posts. He does a lot of fighting with people about social issues on Facebook. And as someone who's passionate about that shit, I get it, I understand where it comes from, but he does it so much and it's kind of toxic that I have to block it. I mean, he's the sort of person who will dig up a post from like five years ago to like have a fight with somebody about something they said a year ago, you know? Like it's a lot. And so this master I'm talking about does not like David. And so I kind of was like over it when he started yelling at me. I forget exactly what he said, but he, he sent me a really long shitty message. And I was like, you know what, dude, I, I genuinely was interested in spending time with you, but you're being too pushy, right? And so I kid you not, like a couple of weeks after I told him that I wasn't interested in spending time with him, I hear this story um, of this girl who gets, who goes over to his place for, for dinner. And now I don't want to spread rumors because if you're in LA, you definitely know who I'm talking about. But the gist of it was that his slaves coerced this woman who came over for dinner into doing some things that she did not agree with. Now, when I heard that story, unfortunately, I recognized that that could have been me and that it would not have been a smart idea for me to go over to this guy's place. I mean, this is a guy who I'll, I'll be at his home with his slaves. There's three of them. And I'm on my own, the only person advocating for myself. Now, of course, this guy always said I could bring people, but I never had people to bring, so I would have probably come alone. And who knows what could have happened? Who knows? And so I was really happy that I didn't put myself in that situation, right? Now, like I said, I met this guy at um, the, the yearly gathering that I would go to. Now, there's another guy that I, also, that I met at this yearly gathering who is also a black man. And he's someone who, like watching him play was just so, like he's a very attractive man, right? He's a very, very attractive man. And his technique is so sensual and so just like nice that it's like hard for you to not, it's really hard for you to like watch him play and not be like, woo, you know? And I was definitely kind of curious about him and I would always see him at these events and I would see him in passing um, and he would give me a look and I would kind of give him like a little look or whatever. And you know, there was definitely interest there and we added each other on Facebook eventually. And we talked about getting breakfast and things like that. It never came to fruition, but it was definitely something that, you know, was on our to-do list. Now, I don't know if you're part of these groups. I definitely would suggest that you do become part of these groups if you're not. But in Los Angeles, I'm part of two different types of groups that are fostered by predominantly women. The BDSM group is not like that, but they're these, they're these like don't date and don't play groups, right? There are these groups on Facebook that are basically just people posting about all the men who are rapists, assaulters, things like that in the LA area. And it's like a really great sort of space for you to find out about people who may or may not be good, um, you know, players or may, may be abusive because a lot of people hide it really, really, really well. And so, you know, I'm in one of my don't play groups and I see this guy. Similar to the story that I just told, he, you know, brings women over to his place, gets them into doing a scene, his slave somehow coerces them into doing something that they don't want to do. And the next thing you know, they're being assaulted. And the word that kept being used over and over again was that she, that, you know, him, him and his partner both raped somebody. And this is like a story that was repeated by not just one person, but several, you know? And when you just keep getting those stories over and over again, it becomes hard for you to ignore, right? And so I look back and I'm like very, very thankful that I never played with that person, right? So this annual event 
came up came up recently and the reason this is the reason why i want to make this video right because i went the year before and i was brand new in the community and i didn't really know a lot about anything and i was you know bright-eyed and bushy-tailed and all these other things and i just you know was still figuring myself out and i walk into this this event this year with a very different feeling a very 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 different feeling because now I know that there are at least two different men at this event who are rapists, who are assaulters, who do violate women, right? And, you know, seeing your performances and seeing their classes last year was amazing. They're both very, very talented people, right? But I come in this year and these are people who people are very aware of these accusations of and they're still teaching classes and they still have their performances. And I'm talking about these two people, but there are a lot of other people in the, in this space that the same could be said about them. And it was just kind of like this really sick recognition, rec um, moment of recognizing that even though we know these people are unsafe, they're still part of the community they're still people who are not only part of the community, but are given positions of power. And so now you have these men who have a history of assaulting women, who are at these events where women like myself are, where you're brand new, you don't know any better, and here's this confident guy who knows the ropes and has a bunch of toys, and you're fed right to him. And you know, to be honest with you guys, when I started seeing that and understanding that, it just became, the community changed for me. It changed for me because I recognized that when you're in the BDSM community, you're kind of in this really awkward position where, you know, you're doing a lot of things that could theoretically be considered to be illegal. You know, if a dom beats you into oblivion and you call the cops and say, he beat me, even if you consented to it and all that other stuff, and you've got bruises and things, you could technically get this guy arrested for assault. You know, there's a lot of weirdness around it. So because of that, a lot of people are not very eager to report things that happen. So a lot of stuff ends up happening within the community and it's just kind of this internal thing because people are really afraid of the cops coming in and busting things up and ruining things, right? I go to occasionally this party, I'm not gonna mention what it is, but you probably know if you're in LA, it's heinously illegal. It's like an incredibly illegal party, but it happens every month because you know they pay off the cops and da 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 da. Um, I was going to this dungeon for a bit where someone got into an accident and the, 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 the fire department came over. Fire department walks in, sees all these people, the dungeon gets shut down. And so there is kind of this weird thing where scary things happen behind closed doors and abusers and assaulters and manipulators, they still somehow have protection because of that, because of the weird people don't wanna, you know, cause it's, it's complicated. There's a lot of people in the BDSM community who do not want to be known in the BDSM community, right? And then there's a lot of people where they don't wanna have to explain where they are and what they're doing. And so they're not gonna report stuff. And going to that event and seeing what it was and seeing the long list of people who were assaulters and abusers and things like that have all this space and authority. It really kind of made me feel quite icky. And that year I got to sort of see some stuff with David that I didn't really like. And when it came to David, I'd heard things, but I had not seen things, right? And my relationship with him was so positive that I honestly, I couldn't buy into a lot of stuff. And when I would tell what people that I was friends with David and that I did scenes with David, people would always give me this like, hmm, sort of reaction. And one of my close um, friends out here, she's a black woman. She kind of gave me very much a like, you'll see, you'll figure it out for yourself sort of thing. Because the thing is, is when you're in Los Angeles, people get reputation and it builds up. And you know, I am unfortunately a very loyal person and so, 
when people were giving me their little myths about David, I didn't quite buy into it, right? And David was always the sort of person who he would turn to a dom and say, well, he did this and he did this, da, 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 da. And even when he would say stuff to me, I'd be like, well, let me figure that out for myself, right? And this is unfortunately just the way that I've gone about things. And I know that for some people that might not be cool, but it's just kind of, I don't like, it's like literally every guy I know, every dom I know has some sort of accusation or something that's happened. So it's be it's just become this sort of like minefield of I don't really know who to believe. I don't know if there were innocent mistakes that have turned into big, big things. I don't know. And so I try to re reserve my judgment, right? At this event that we're at, um, he has his brand new sub who is a black woman. And his sub that um, was brand new when I met him was also at the event. And, and the brand new sub is an Asian woman. And so I'm sitting there and we're watching, we're watching a, a pet play demonstration, which was very interesting. I'd never seen that. I didn't know that pets could be more than dogs and, and cats. There was like a dragon, a triceratops, or all types of like interesting pet play pets, right? Anyway, um, but he's sitting there with his new partner and I'd seen his partner, the, the Asian woman um, earlier, and she was having a really hard time finding David. And I had been hanging out with David. I'd seen David all day, but I couldn't understand like why they couldn't find each other. It just seemed weird, right? So we're sitting here watching this pet play demonstration and he turns to his new sub and says, you know, so-and-so really, really wants to serve. Do you want anything? And she says, you know, yeah, I guess I want like a cup of coffee, right? And so, you know, I'm assuming that he, you know, messages, you know, his other sub and, you know, she goes and gets the coffee and, you know, that's how that's gonna be, right? And so at a certain point, David and his sub and I, we all kind of split ways, right? I go to like this Dom male social and up upstairs and then I go and walk around a bit, right? Um, and I walk around, I'm walking around this sort of vendor area and I run into, his other sub, the Asian woman, and she's walking around holding a cup of, holding coffee cup. And mind you, it's been about four hours between there and now, you know? She's still walking around with this cup of coffee because she hasn't been able to find David. And this was the first time I sort of saw it. This was the first time I sort of saw the way that he neglected his partners, right? Where, because you know, you've got these, these people who are like, oh, I'm solo poly, oh, I'm so this, I'm so that, you know? And you, you take it at, at face value and you respect it, right? But you know, sometimes the people who are solo poly or are relationship anarchists, they're kind of just assholes and they're looking for sort of this way to sort of explain why they're assholes, right? And I don't think that David's necessarily an asshole, but I definitely think that he is neglectful in a way that he doesn't totally always see, right? Um, and so it blew my mind that she was sitting there or standing there rather with a cup of coffee that you know, she his, his you know David Sub had asked for hours ago, and she did not look happy. She was not in a great mood, you know, and it just you could sense that things were not going well, right? And so, a couple of days after that, they go through this really big public terrible breakup, and it comes out that he's been gaslighting her and you know preying on her her mental illness. Um, and, and, and just being overall really shitty. Um, and another partner of his came out and said the same thing. A white woman came out and said the same exact thing where he was being really crappy. You know, there'd be issues that they would have and he would basically diagnose them and say that, you know, they need they need to take meds, they need to do this, they need to do that. They would even, go, he'd even go as far as to find medication to give the person. like. All this stuff that to me, I would not have seen, you know, because I was still on my like, oh, he's a good guy. Oh, he's, you know, he's fine, da, 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 da. I wouldn't, you know what I mean? Like I wasn't seeing it. I wasn't seeing it. And then I had recognized that his sort of pattern was he would meet these new women and he would be the person who defines BDSM for them. And I recognized that that's kind of what we were, is that he had met me right when I started and he was the person who sort of got me into, introduced me into BDSM and things like that. 
And, you know, it's just one of those things where, again, you don't see it immediately, but with time, it starts to become a bit more clear. And I definitely recognized that in the BDSM community, you kind of just have a lot of these sort of people because this is a guy who takes up a lot of space. Like I said, he likes to do a lot of the club events. He's always doing, you know, taste testing um, booths and things like that. Like he takes up a lot of space and he's very, 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 very loud. But it turns out he's probably not the best person to do that with. But you wouldn't sort of see that when you first get into the club because of how loud he is and because of how big he is, you know? It's like when I really look at the vast majority of male doms who have any sort of, who take up any sort of space at a lot of these events, a lot of them aren't great people. And, you know, knowing what I know now about the BDSM community and how often they harbor abusers and they won't, you know, because like, so for example, at one of the dungeons that I go to, David, knew of a woman who was assaulted, you know? And he went to the owner of this dungeon and said, hey, this guy is a rapist. We need to make sure that he's not at these events. And their reaction to that was, well, we can't, you know, we can't go on gossip, we can't discriminate. We, we're not gonna ban someone outright from coming to our club, you know? Now, it would seem like, it would seem like, banning a rapist from, from your club would be an obvious decision, you know, an obvious thing to do, right? But as it turns out, as it turns out, this particular dungeon is not as quick to do that. And when you find out about more of the dungeons, because it's not just the one, and you dig deep and you dig deep, you just recognize that a lot of these dungeons do harbor people who are assaulters. There are DMs at one of the dungeons that I go to who have assault, you know, accusations from several people. Um, it's like this never ending sort of thing where people who are abusive end up getting a lot of leeway and say, which has made me less and less, I'm less likely to suggest people go to these spaces because I don't want to feed them to the lions, right? And it's a really shitty thing. You know, like I said, when you first get into the BDSM community, public play just seems like the right way to go about things. It just seems like the best idea. But with time, I'm recognizing no, it's not. It's not. I've had a more fulfilling dynamic with my partner who is a switch and we've great BDSM, no, no problems, no accusations, no violations. He's just a great guy and we have a lot of fun and we trust each other, you know? And so I guess my issue with the BDSM community really, really boils down to how easy it is for people to, to get into the community and become big figures and how often those people who are actual assaulters, who do actually, you know, assault people and violate women, still somehow aren't ousted from the community. You know, a lot of the things that people have told me are so, are so ghastly. And again, I tend not to believe things unless I hear it time and time and time and time and time again, right? It's made me feel very on edge. I can't say, that I'm comfortable in the BDSM community. Well, that's not true. I am comfortable in the BDSM community. I do still go to events, but I go to events with partners or I now know enough people who are good to know sort of who to trust. But those people who are good are not the people that are in the leadership positions. It's more often than not the people that are in the leadership positions are the not great people. So that's my issue with the BDSM community. Anyway, I'm very, very, very curious to hear if this is an issue that a lot of people who are active in the BDSM community have also found. You know, for me, I'm again, still unpacking whether or not this is something to do with just the inherent nature of men who want to fulfill that dominant role. You know, is it just sort of par for, for the course that dominant men end up being abusive. I would like to believe that's not the case. I would like to believe that that's not how things are. But unfortunately, it becomes sort of hard for me not to see things that way when I just keep running into the same exact issue time and time and time and time again. 
Abusers and harassers are protected in the BDSM community. They are not outright out ousted because people fear the repercussions of what that might do. They fear the crackdown. They fear people taking their space away from them. And to be fair, that's, it's, it's valid to some degree because these spaces are so far few in, be, in, in between, you know? A lot of people want these things to thrive, but personally, I think that the best way to continue to have these spaces, you know, thrive and be successful is to, is to completely oust those people. I mean, I just, we, we just had an event canceled at this space where a, a known, a known rapist was hosting this event. It was at his 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 um, warehouse space. A known rapist. People were willing to host an event there until a lot of people made noise about it and said that they weren't going to come. Right? And it was like, I'm glad that people pulled out. I'm really glad that that's the conclusion that we reached. But still, man, I mean. It sucks that it takes that much. So anyway, I would really love to hear what you guys have to say. Thank you guys so much for watching this video. I'm really curious how those of you guys who are curious about BDSM feel about this. I I feel like it's really dicey. I think the munches are still good things, are good to go to, but I don't know about, about everything else. So anyway, thank you so much for watching this video. Right now you're looking at two videos that you can watch if you wanna to continue to sip true tea right here on this channel. I appreciate those of you guys who continue to watch all these videos and stick with me, thank you so much. And if you got something out of this video in the corner, you can tip me, there's, there's various ways you can do so. So yeah, I appreciate it. And you guys are helping me buy food. So thank you so much. All right, I will talk to you guys next week. Bye.